Chapter 40, Maniac McGee. He ran far that day, away from the town, letting the wind wash him. When he returned to the West End, he heard in the distance Mrs. Pickwell whistling her children to dinner. Though he had heard the whistle many times, he had not answered it since the first day in town. Now he felt, as he had that day, that it was meant for him. This time, of course, there was a difference. He was no stranger. He was Maniac McGee, the kid who had walked barefoot through the dump near their house. The Pickwell kids cheered when he showed up and treated him like a legend in the flesh. Mrs. Pickwell did better. She treated him like a member of the family, as if she would have surprised, as if she would have been surprised if he had not come on the whistle. Nor was Maniac the only visitor for dinner. Mr. Pickwell had brought home a down-and-out shoe salesman in sore need of sympathy and a good meal. As Maniac ate and talked and laughed his way through dinner, he couldn't help thinking of the Beals and how alike these two families were. Friendly, giving, accepting. So easily he could picture the Beals' brown faces around this dinner table and the little Pickwell kids' white bodies in the bathtub at 728 Sycamore. Whoever had made of Hector Street a barrier, it was surely not these people. Fortified by his good time at the Pickwells, Maniac returned to the McNabs. After the East End scare, Russell and Piper no longer demanded sons of him and returned for attending school. On the one hand, this was a relief to Maniac but on the other, it left him with less influence over them. He could always extort a day or two in class from them with a free weekly pizza. Beyond that, he goaded them toward school any way he could. He organized a marbles tournament that could take place only in the schoolyard during recess. He tried reading to them, as he had to Hester and Lester and the Grayson, but they had paid as much attention as the roaches. He took them to the library and then scrapped that idea after their shenanigans left the librarian blubbering and blue-faced. Then May arrived with its warm weather and blew away what little power he had left. The boys began, to get, be, began again to dream of travel. Wood appeared in the backyard. They were building a raft. Gonna sail down the river to the ocean, they said. One day he heard frenzied horn honking and screaming. He turned to see an ancient, rusty, gas-high convertible rolling by with Russell behind the wheel and Piper jumping up and down and shrieking in the back seat. By the time Maniac caught up, they were gone, and the car was shuddering against the telephone pole. Another time he had to run them down and haul them back to Dorsey's Grocery, where he made them empty their bulging pockets of 50 bubble, bomb, bubble gums they had stolen. It was a maddening, chaotic time for Maniac. Running in the mornings and reading in the afternoons gave him just enough stability to endure the zany nights at Big Mab's. When he asked himself why he didn't just drop it, drop them, the answer was never clear. It wasn't so much that he wanted to stay as that he couldn't go. In some vague way, to abandon the McNabb boys would be to abandon something in himself. He couldn't shake the suspicion that deep inside Russell and Piper McNabb, in the prayer dark seat of their kidhoods, they were identical to Hester and Lester Beale. But they were spoiling, they were rotting from the outside in, like a pair of peaches in the sun. Soon, unless he, unless somebody did something, the rot would reach the pit. And yet he held back. Oh, he prodded and persuaded and inspired and bribed the boys to do right. But he never forced them. He never commanded, never shouted, because to do so would be parental. And he was not yet ready for that. How could he act as a father to these boys when he himself ached to be somebody's son? But then one day the boys went too far. He found them playing with the old glove Grayson had given him for Christmas. As if that weren't enough, enough, they were using it as a football, and they were punting it back and forth. Maniac exploded. He popped off for a good ten minutes and got it all out. This was the last straw, he told them. From now on, it would be different. No more, Mr. Nice Guy. When I say jump, you say how high. Got it? They got it. For the first time in their lives, the boys were speechless. Speechless as they did their homework speechless as they went to bed at nine o'clock and speechless as they went off to school the next morning. The peace lasted three days. Shock accounted for the first day and the second and third days were a new game called obedience or being good. When the game lost its appeal, Maniac lost his power. He told them to sit and they stood. He told them to stand and they sat. Instead of going to school, they worked on their raft and instead of doing homework, they played war in the pillbox. They brought their plastic weapons down from the hole and they stationed themselves at the two small gunnery slots in the cinder block wall, and they blasted away at anyone moving through the house, not to mention imaginary rebels streaming through the door and over the window mills. Stop! Maniac finally yelled, and he snatched the two red barrel guns protruding from the slots. In a moment, 
Two more guns appeared. Stop, he commanded. I ain't shooting you, Russell whined. We're shooting Webbles. Bam, 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 pow. Got one, pow, bam, got another, bam, bam. I said, stop. Maniac grabbed the guns and he threw them on the floor and he stomped on them. He didn't stop till they were plastic splinters. The only sound was that of the turtle scratching somewhere in the room. The gunnery slots framed the boys' dumbstruck faces, and Russell was the first to speak. Get out of my house. Yeah, sneered Piper. Out of heel. Maniac went upstairs, got his satchel, and was gone. That night and the next night, he slept at the park, and the following day, as he was reading in the library, in came the McNabb boys, and they rushed over to him. Hey, Maniac, blurted Piper. We've been looking all over for you. You got to come to my birthday party. I'm having a party tomorrow. What do you say, huh? You coming, huh? Maniac couldn't believe it. The ugly feelings of the other day showed nowhere on their excited faces. Come on, Maniac, you gotta. And just like that, as he stared at them, the idea came. An idea as zany as they were. The words seemed to lift right off of their faces, like sunburnt skin peeling. Well, okay, he said, on one condition. What's the at? Well, can I bring somebody with me? Sure, bring everybody. We're going to party. The librarian edged closer to the phone.